Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this book discussion on Competition Overdose, a book authored by Maurice e. Stuckey and Ariel Iraqi. My name is Debanshu. I'm one of the co-founders of Vidhi. A quick word about the authors. Professor Stuckey is the Douglas A. Blaze Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Professor Izraki is the Slaughter and May Professor of Competition Law at the University of Oxford, and also the Director of the University of Oxford Center for Competition Law and Policy. We are also fortunate to have Dr. Montek Singh Aluwalia, one of India's most prominent economists and the former Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission of India, as a discussant for this session. Thank you all three of you for joining us. Uh, we have about one hour for the discussion and we'll reserve about 15 minutes for a quick round of Q&A right at the end of the hour. <clears throat> uh, in the late 80s, uh, when my parents, two doctors in Raipur, a small town in central India, were looking to buy their first car, they only had two affordable options, the Fiat Padmini and Maruti 800. They also had two other options, the Ambassador and Contessa, but they were more expensive, uh, despite being only marginally better. Mm. We were fortunate to have a television at home, but like everyone else, we only had one channel, our very own Doordarshan, a government-run network. And people talking to each other on screens in this manner over the internet was only possible in science fiction and possibly in comic books. We live in a very different world today, a world full of choices and possibilities shaped by free markets and competition and all the development and innovation that they have unleashed. But have we gone too far? Are free markets and excessive competition among businesses beginning to harm us? Let's hear from the authors of this book to understand this better. So over to you, professors. Thank you so much for the kind inter introduction and thank you uh, for having us. It's a pleasure to join you. I'll share my screen um, just to, um, uh, to provide a short um, kind of uh, explanation about the book and its scope for 15 minutes and then we'll be delighted to engage um, in the debate. Okay, so hopefully you can all see, see the screen. And um, our book, um, as the title suggests, is about competition overdose. And it's, it's very important when we start talking about it um, to, to establish the basics, which are, of course, that competition is extremely beneficial. The book does not intend to question the merit of competition. A lot of what we see around us is the result of competitive dynamic. We have uh, better products, greater innovation, choice, quality, and of course, lower prices. So this is the starting point. However, uh, over the years, both Maurice and I, we've been practicing um, competitional for many years, and you cannot uh, help by noticing that the idea of competition has elevated itself almost to a religion. So in any context, if you say that something is pro-competitive, it is regarded as the ultimate uh, explanation, defense against any intervention. And yet despite this, and despite the promise of competition, many of us feel as if we're in a rat race. So we are told, don't worry, competition will deliver. And yet a lot of the times we work longer hours, we're getting paid much less. And the promised benefit of, com of competition, the consumer welfare doesn't really feel as if it reaches us. So the question that we raise is whether we overdosed on competition, whether despite what economists know very well, which is that competition dynamic in itself, it's just a dynamic and you have to be very well aware of the intensity of competition and the possible adverse outcomes of competition. Despite that, we removed all the warning labels. And in fact, what we have in many societies is policymakers that do not necessarily understand the limitations of competition and misuse the idea of competition. So Maurice will tell us a little bit about how we structure the debate in the book. 
So what we did, and thank, thank you so much for, for inviting us and reaching out to us for this opportunity. So we, we first wanted to understand what were the assumptions underlying competition? And when, when does competition deliver and when doesn't it deliver? And what happens then when you relax some of these assumptions? And that led us to the first part. And what we've come up with are four overdoses. And in each one, we relaxed one, one of the assumptions underlying competition. And then you could see then how the ensuing competition could be toxic. And it can lead to hockey players without helmets. It could lead to um, horse meat in, in, in your hamburger. It could lead to overdose on dating apps. And it could lead to that <laughs> surcharge when you go to a um, hotel. So once, once we dug in, we, we recognized that this is not as great an anom anomaly as we originally had thought. And there can be quite a bit of toxic competition around us. And so then we were wondering who's pushing this um, toxic competition. We came up with several culprits, including what we'll talk about today, the game makers. And then the last part is what are we gonna do about it, right? How can we reorient competition to something nobler? And what we understood then is that competition doesn't simply exist. And we don't have to necessarily accept one form of competition. There can be multiple forms of competition and policymakers then can choose which type of which type of competition uh, would be lead to the best um, outcome? Uh, uh, I'm on a Zoom uh, conference. Can I call you back later? Sure, of so, course, at your convenience. So that led us then to what's the uh, first overdose that we um, 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 have? Okay. So what we'll do is we'll very briefly go through two or three overdoses. I'll, I'll just mention the first one, which is really intuitive. But if you think of it, when we speak about competition, the assumption we make is if we increase the pressure of competition, we as consumers will benefit. And that assumption is anchored in our idea that uh, markets work really well. So consumers can identify changes in quality, changes in service, changes in price, and therefore the market has to deliver. But it is so easy to see examples where markets actually do not operate the way that they are supposed to. Once you move from the textbooks to reality, you see that most markets are imperfect. Take, for example, the Horsegate scandal in, in, in Europe. What we had is fierce competition between supermarkets. They put pressure on their and meat suppliers, and the meat suppliers want to keep the business. But what do they do? They start downgrading the quality. And the way they've done it in Europe is to start and um, get horse meat and put it into the supply chain. And later on, it was revealed that many times you get blocks of, of meat and it will stay the beef, but it will be 100 horse meat. Or all your frozen uh, dishes will have horse meat, which of course, uh, was not declared, and there, there is the whole issue of uh, the, the viability of the supply chain. And why did this happen? Because if you increase the pressure of competition, but you're not aware of the need at the same time to increase your supervision of the quality, then what will give will be other dimensions of competition. And in this case, we have that, but I'm sure you heard stories. If you look at fish, if you look at spices, Almost any food in our supply chain is plagued by the fact that we are so price focused that when we demand lower prices, we might get them, but we also get a completely different product. Now, this is not just things that affect you in the supermarket. One of the, the rather unfortunate examples, of course, is the, the Boeing 737 MAX. And there were many reasons uh, for these tragedies. But when you speak with the engineers, what you realize that it's the intense competition between Boeing and Airbus and the need that Boeing had to develop a new airplane without requiring training that led to intense pressure on the engineers to develop an airplane without the pilots having to undergo training, which meant that they hid the fact that they put new automated systems. They just didn't tell the pilots. So you see again what happens and here, you know, you ask, what about the Federal Aviation Administrator? Well, they outsourced 
their role to Boeing. Boeing basically stamped its own process, declaring that it was safe enough. What it just shows you is that many times we assume the market will protect us. So we increase the pressure in this competition boiler, but because we are unaware of truly all the dynamics of competition, if all you do is just increase the pressure, don't be surprised when the market under delivers. Maurice will tell us now a little bit about how we move um, from uh, a process that benefits us to a process that exploits us. So yesterday in my class, we went over the Kodak decision and the court earlier in the class, we, we looked at the professional engineers and there the professional engineer said that, you know, competition will force us to, um, to, to save and it could make then the bridges unsafe because everyone's going to compete on price. And then what's going to happen in order to, when if there's a cost increase or something, the engineers are going to save money elsewhere and that's going to make the bridges unsafe. And the Supreme Court rejected that defense. They said there's no reason that you can't compete on price competition. And it's not a defense that competition can be ruinous. And then yesterday, we had another case involving uh, copiers. And Kodak was engaging in this anti-competitive practice. And the same court found that, well, consumers can't rely on competition because the companies would have the incentive, would have a greater incentive and can make more profits in exploiting us than actually telling consumers about the exploitation. And I, I always thought that was an interesting juxtaposition between the two um, cases. So one of the assumptions underlying competition is that we're perfectly rational, that we have willpower and we can choose what we desire and our short-term and our long-term interests are aligned. But as the field of behavioral economics has pointed out, that that's not necessarily the case. And we have imperfect willpower, that there are various biases and heuristics that can manipulate our behavior. So once you understand that, what's then the implication? And we go then to the next slide, <laughs> which, which involves the game makers. And the game makers is a slightly different um, um, story. And with that, unlike behavioral exploitation, where it's more profitable to exploit consumers than to inform them. And so firms engage in that. The game makers are the ones who create the competitive process. And this is from the Hunger Games. And what they do is they design the competitive process in order to ensure that whoever wins or loses, they ultimately come out ahead. And so Ariel and I both watched the, the, the Hunger Games series and we were wondering, you know, who are today's game makers? And you could say that some of the um, TV producers who come up with the, um, with the game shows, that they always come out ahead because it doesn't really matter which contestant, like in The Amazing Race or Survivor or any of these other shows, wins. Ultimately, so long as they attract us, they can deliver ads to us, the producers of the TV show will win. Then we thought, well, who else can design the, um, the ecosystem to ensure that whoever wins, they're going to come out ahead? And that's Google and Facebook in the behavioral advertising sector. And so there's been a lot of recent interest in this, also some um, recent litigation in the United States. But what you have is an ecosystem that largely is dominated by two firms. Amazon is a distant third. They capture most of the profits and you have millions of websites and apps that are competing for advertising revenue. You have millions of advertisers that are competing to get their ads onto these uh, websites and apps. And regardless of who wins or loses this particular auction, the game maker always comes out ahead. And then it's important to understand why they come out ahead. And they control some of the critical inputs. They control our attention and they control our data. And so what we've seen here is in this ecosystem, they can drive a particular type of competition 
where we don't necessarily benefit, where the advertisers and the uh, website publishers and app developers don't necessarily benefit, but they all have to be in it because otherwise they're at a competitive disadvantage. And one of the things that we're now looking at is the implication that the game makers have on innovation in our most recent book. But you can't then assume that, first off, that Google and Facebook's interests are aligned with our interests or that this type of competition will necessarily improve our welfare or well being. So, um... <clears throat> And, and some of these insights are, are also based on our book, uh, Virtual uh, Competition. Um, so where it leads us is to the realization that there are many instances, and we go through them in the book, in which competition is imperfect and basically uh, it backfires. But also, as we mentioned, the game makers, we also look at lobbyists, we look at various groups that have the interest of advances, advancing this uh, suboptimal uh, type type of competition. And the last part of the book, which we're not going to go into in detail here, is our attempt to map the different types of competition. So as a policymaker or as, or as a consumer, you can understand the scenario in which you find yourself, and therefore you know whether competition will deliver and what are the limitations of competition. And of course, at, at the end, or you know, the negative end, you'll have toxic competition, but there are many times that you'll have zero sum competition uh, just because there's no other way of doing it. But what we propose and what we put forward in the book is the realization that competition dynamic can be managed and can be influenced by the state or by the game maker. So as long as we put the incentives in place, we can all shift toward what we call noble competition, where competition has traces that actually do more than just encourage rivalry. When what you're trying to promote is a situation where competition truly delivers, both in terms of quality, service, and price, but also in terms of the overall social uh, impact. I know we're short on time, so we'll, we'll end with that. I hope that gave you a good indication of, of what the, the book um, uh, covers and, and we'll be delighted to engage in the, in the debate. Thank you, thank you so much, professors. Uh, several thought-provoking questions there and if I may say uh, some scary uh, facts as well. Uh, Dr. Aluwalia, uh, you were one of the key people in Dr. Manmohan Singh's team when the 91 reforms were being designed and thus one of the originators of the market forces that we live with in India today. So uh, how does this book resonate with you? Uh, do you believe uh, with the main thrust, do, do, you, do you kind of believe in the main thrust of this book? Uh, sir, I think you're on mute. Well, thank you. Um, but first of all, let me, let me thank you for inviting me. Uh, and, you know, uh, particularly persuading me to read this wonderful book. I mean, I think uh, I just want to say to both uh, Professor Stuck and Professor Ezratri uh, that um, most economists would benefit hugely uh, from reading the book. And secondly, you know, I found, I mean, uh, particularly the section on game makers, which is perhaps the area that we in India are least familiar with, although it's all over us at the moment, I really found that fascinating. Now, clearly from the way you introduced me, you sort of expected me to be attacking the premises of the book. It's quite wrong. Uh, the book is actually very fair. Uh, they're clearly not against competition. Uh, and uh, I mean, they're really against overdose. That's what the book is about. Overdose of competition, toxic competition, etc. But since you mentioned the 1991 reforms, let me say that at that point, uh, there simply wasn't any question that it was an overregulated economy. You know, Joan Robinson, who was uh, by no means a liberal uh, market type economist in Cambridge. I mean, she, she used to say two things about uh, Adam Smith's invisible hand, which my generation of economists uh, certainly were fully aware of. One of them is that 
most of the time, the invisible hand can't even be seen. And that was certainly true uh, in the over-regulated economy that we had uh, earlier. Uh, and the next one was that you should be very careful lest the invisible hand grab you by the throat. And I think a lot of what this book is talking about are examples where the invisible hand is grabbing you by the throat. Now, you know, professionally, economists have always known that uh, the easy assumption that competition will lead to a better outcome is subject to a whole lot of conditions. Uh, I mean, the usual, I mean, income distribution should be just and fair. Uh, if you're gonna have a shift uh, as a result of competitive changes, the gainers uh, by definition will be in a position, uh, the, the, the result is Pareto optimal, which means the gainers potentially could, could compensate the losers, but of course, in actual fact, they don't. So it matters whether they do or they don't, how people view competition. And you know, uh, the, the whole argument about the full information, symmetry of information, full markets and efficient markets, including futures markets. I mean, if you made a list of all these things, you could very easily uh, come to the conclusion that these ideal conditions don't exist in real life. Uh, and, and I mean, but what's the conclusion? The conclusion clearly is not that you don't have competition. The conclusion is that you, you see what you're doing and look at some of the uh, warnings uh, that are very nicely brought out in the book itself. You know, my, uh, I, I wish that uh, the Vidhi uh, Legal Center would take up the individual examples that they've given and kind of write a paper showing that there are so many Indian examples which are more or less identical. I mean, they won't be the same, but every example of a competitive failure uh, which is mentioned in the book, uh, can, can be uh, sort of highlighted by what does it mean in Indian conditions? I mean, right now, there's incredible controversy that's going on about the farm laws, where the government says they're increasing the opportunity to the farmers, and the farmers say they're going to make them vulnerable to the impact, uh, vulnerable to exploitative behavior by a few crony capitalists. It's a good example of that. There are many others. So, you know, my view is that uh, you obviously, as we move towards a market economy, uh, and by the way, even more so move towards a digital economy, because that's why I, I felt that the game maker section, I, I mean, I really, first of all, I didn't realize all that they say is true. And I, it was kind of, I didn't have the time, but I proposed to go back and read that section more carefully. But it's certainly something that we need to be much more aware of. You know, most people have talked about competition uh, uh, having to be regulated. So you can think of different, I mean, the horse meat example uh, is a case of poor regulation uh, of quality standards in whatever is being sold. I mean, in India, we have hundreds of such examples, mainly because a lot of it is informal. So you really can't do regulation if you have a whole lot of informal producers producing things. But there's the other issue, and that is that um, uh, either the ideologues or the lobbyists can actually capture the regulatory system. That is a hugely important thing in India. Uh, and I think we need to be very aware of it. The system works differently. Because in the United States, of course, because of the separation between the, um, uh, the legislature and the executive, there's a huge amount of lobbying that just goes on of the legislators themselves. That doesn't happen so much in India because uh, guys vote according to party whips. So you don't have to bother, uh, you do them a favor here or there, but the real regulatory capture comes by essentially directly trying to appeal to whoever's the party in power. And I think that I have no doubt that in the literature in India, these things are being talked about, uh, but they're not in fact adequately appreciated. So we need to sort of Indianize these examples uh, and then have a discussion on what we should do. But you know, in the end, uh, more information, shining some sunlight on what's happening, better regulation and ways of preventing regulatory capture. I mean, these are really things that we have to do a lot of. But 
I, I, going back to what you said, I don't feel even remotely apologetic for the changes we brought about in 1991. That was a ridiculous degree of government control, which was without a doubt creating a hopelessly uh, suboptimal system. So that was the right thing to do. But now that we've moved, we haven't yet completely deregulated, but now that we are much further ahead, uh, we need to be much more aware of the problems uh, which the authors uh, have brought out in this book. So let me once again thank them. I really enjoyed the book. Uh, and I hope that Vidhi Legal Center will uh, use it as a basis for constructive dialogue on what are its implications for India. Thank you. We certainly will, sir. Uh, thank you so much for those remarks. Uh, so, uh, professors, Dr. Aluwalia, you know, talked about you know the the, the role of lobbying and the, the manner in which uh, big corporates can influence the rules of the game and kind of game the system and use it in their favor. Uh, could you please explain that a bit in, in, in a bit more detail as to how it actually happens in the US? Sure, yeah. so <laughs> it's, um, it's uh, actually that in our, in our latest book where we look at the game makers but apply it to innovation, right? We find in fact that it's even worse and it's worse than it's imagined. And all you need to see is that Yesterday, Senator Klobuchar said that money flows throughout the um, Congress and it flows throughout, um, it reaches every member. And it's not only just the money, but what we find it's the ideological capture. Because with money, yeah, that parties can change, but if you can capture someone ideologically and having worked at one of the agencies, and you have people who have this belief that it works this way. And they're, they're not even amenable to re-looking at the evidence that may be contradictory. That's worth far more than just buying off someone. Because now you have someone who sees it as their vocation in order to propagate that ideology. And where the, the game makers currently are investing is not so much lobbying, but getting the hearts and minds of the next generation of legal scholars, going to judges, and then training them in their worldview. And then that has an impact. And one of the big culprits that we identify is George Mason, gets a lot of money from um, Qualcomm and some of the uh, big tech firms. And they then propagate this view on the way that markets work, and also, I, you know, innovation, it's sort of the third rail. Well, if you do anything like regulate, you're gonna kill and stifle innovation. And there's this ideology that has, it's, it's not by accident, it's, it's just carefully groomed to ensure that those that control the ecosystem preserve it in such a way to maintain the status quo because they're gonna primarily benefit. So uh, essentially, not just uh, direct lobbying, but you know this kind of organized propaganda to you know to basically spread the word out, uh, you know, in in their favor. So uh, staying with that, Dr. Aluwale, do you think we kind of have the same kind of risks in India as well, uh, given the fact that you know our our structure is uh, a bit different and we have this permanent bureaucracy which kind of insulates the lawmaking process uh, from. Uh, direct political intervention, uh, at least in theory. Well, let me, by the way, uh, just one comment that on the, if you want a good example of how uh, lobbying uh, affects policy, just go back to some of the stuff written about the financial deregulation that occurred before the financial crisis of 2008 and people moving seamlessly from uh, Goldman Sachs to the US Treasury and changing the rules in a way which exactly favored exactly the interests of the investment banks. I mean, this is uh, in a way the, the somewhat, the discrediting of uh, the great Alan Greenspan uh, is, uh, is an example uh, of uh, discovering after the event that what was at one stage made out to be, I mean, these were the masters of the universe and look what they did kind of thing. So there's no doubt. 
as far as India is concerned, please don't have any assumption that the permanent bureaucracy is any kind of protection at all. I mean, let's face it, it's not a permanent bureaucracy. It just means you can't be fired, but you can be moved from your job to some unimportant job. And nobody joins the government in India because these guys are very underpaid compared to the private sector. Nobody moves into a government job uh, to say, well, look, my salary is secure. Doesn't matter if I'm put into some lousy job. So frankly, I mean, and, and in my view, I don't think it, it's the job of the bureaucracy to make sure that they don't do anything illegal. I mean, to obey an illegal order would be wrong. And I believe that most of them would. But you know, it's not their job to prevent changes from being made so that what is legal changes. So frankly, these guys, I mean, all of them would do uh, what their political masters want. And as a matter of fact, in a functioning political system, the responsibility rests with the political side. I don't think one should, one should ever say, well, of course, you know, he's a politician and I expect him to have this view, but what was the civil servant doing? Because the civil servant is meant to be res responding to whatever the politician wants. And when they're changing the rules and making the rules transparent, it's the job of the system as a whole to hold up uh, the changes and to, as it were, indicate that, look, this doesn't seem to make sense. Now, frankly, some of that is happening. I mean, for example, currently, uh, the e-commerce rules, which the Ministry of Consumer Affairs have put out, uh, a good thing is that the rules were subjected to a great deal of discussion before they were actually implemented. The discussion revealed a lot of res uh, resistance and criticism, including some from different branches of the government itself and of course from outsiders. And it became very clear that some of these rules are not really driven by the desire to protect consumers, which is what the job of the Ministry of Consumer Affairs is. It's really driven by the desire to protect particular producers or particular people participating in the game. I mean, in a way, any rule that you make is gonna be favoring some and not favoring the others. So that by itself is not a criticism. But it ought to be brought out and the public ought to be aware of it and concerned people ought to know and alternatives should be made public. And that's the only way it can happen. In that sense, I think what we need is a much, much stronger system of public discussion uh, of whatever changes are being made. And uh, I don't think our guys do enough of that. I mean, typically, I mean, after all, when a law is introduced and this parliament debated, et cetera, most of our guys wait until the result and then see how it affects them rather than sort of, you know, have people who can say, look, this is a crazy change and they'll have this and that and the other effect. So we need to do much more of that. And Vidhi Legal Center can, can play a major role in that process, if you ask me. Again, sir, you know, uh, we will definitely try to the you know best of our ability. Although you know we are not that powerful, we wish. Uh, I didn't mean powerful. I just mean you might become influential. Yeah. I mean, if you were powerful, you would be the subject of direct lobbying. <laughs> Possibly, sir. So yeah, thankfully we are not that powerful then. So uh, uh, you know, there's another interesting subject discussed in the book. You know, which resonates with a lot of us here in India, which is the subject of privatization. Uh, the mantra here and uh, for a long time has been that, you know, uh, and for, for anything that is traditionally done by the government, especially if it's a business that's traditionally run by a government, if it's not doing well, then give it to the private sector. Uh, in, in, in this book, uh, Professor Izraki and Professor Stuck, you argue that uh, this, this approach can become problematic. Can you give us some examples of how privatization can be problematic in the framework of uh, this competition or ideology that you talk about. You yes, want me to, uh, are you addressing sorry. it to one of the authors? Yeah, I, I, was, I was asking the authors. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. So yeah, thanks for that. Um, if, if I may just very brief comment on, on the, the issue of, of capture. If you look closely at competition law, our starting assumption is that markets will self-correct. This is how the discipline emerged. So all you need, is just a seed of doubt. So your money can go very far 
in the context of competition law because all you need is to create the conditions that someone doubts whether there is an abuse of a dominant position, whether there is harm to competition. Because if there is doubt, then surely it's better not to intervene. And part of the debate that you have at the moment is maybe to change our base assumptions as to the likelihood of digital markets uh, self-correcting. But I think what it means is that competition or despite agencies predominantly being independent um, is, is an area where you can with relatively limited funds uh, make a great impact in driving it into irrelevance. Uh, and possibly if you look at the US in previous years, not the current administration, that's not a bad example of how you can really limit enforcement and efficacy of, uh, of competition. Now your question about privatization, we make a very simple point. Um, privatization can be extremely efficient because governments tend to be uh, inefficient many times and you have government error and you have government capture. So many times the market will deliver. But what we try to highlight again is the idea of overdose. How, if what you do is just assume that the market will always deliver, then what you start doing is privatize functions that the state is actually probably in a better position to provide those functions. Or alternatively, you privatize certain industries where because of externalities, the market just doesn't deliver. And we give many of many examples, I'll, I'll give you two. One is um, prisons in the US where it might be that the private prisons can be more efficient, but what really happens is because uh, of the way that the contracts are conducted, what you have is adverse incentives. Prisons have the opposite incentive of society. Prisons basically want more people to be sent into prison and for the longest period. And actually they have no interest in supporting any rehabilitation of the prisoners. That's of course the opposite of what society would generally say, you know, yes, in prison people that committed a crime, but let's try to re return them to society. So you have Real, real distortions from uh, bribing judges to, uh, to send people to jail, to not providing any conditions to prisoners um, and punishing them by adding more days to their sentence. So anything you do, the, the punishment is you stay longer in prison because it's a money-making machine. Now, does it mean that private prisons cannot deliver? No, of course they can if you will have the right contracts. Why don't you have the right contracts? It goes back to the issue of capture, lobbying, and money. The contracts were distorted. And basically, while people are told competition benefits us as society and does a better job from the government, the reality is that it's not competition. Money took a function from the government and gave the profit to someone else. And we sell the idea to you as if it's competition. I'll give you another example. Thames Water, uh, I mean, basically all the water supply here in, in the south of England was privatized because the idea was that competition will deliver greater benefits. How can you create more competition when you have fixed infrastructure? This is something that we can have a whole debate on. The reality is that if you compare what we pay for water now here to what is paid in Scotland that remained at government control, we pay almost double. And if you look at what happened since privatization, they took loans in the billions, those companies that got hold of the infrastructure. And if you ask yourself, what did they do with those sums? All you have to look is that the dividends they divided. Basically, money was lent, money was borrowed, money was divided to those in power. So does it mean that privatization is always a bad idea? Of course not so many times it will deliver. But it does mean that if you assume that there is some sort of a magic out there, that when you outsource your problem to the market, the market will always deliver, think again. The market has to be a market that works and it has to be a contract that is not distorted by interested parties. Uh, Dr. Aluwalia, fortunately in India, we haven't yet started talking about privatizing systems like prisons. Uh, but over the last 30 years, most governments, irrespective of the political party in power, 
have supported privatization in general. And this government has also said on record that the government uh, shouldn't have any business of being in any business. Uh, the benefits in terms of efficiency are for everyone to see. Uh, in backstage, you also, uh, uh, the, the, your, your book on uh, the 1991 reforms and your subsequent work with the government, you also argue in support of privatization, especially uh, privatization of our largest public sector banks. Uh, which are in a certain sense relics of our pre-91 economy. Uh, but do you foresee any risks of the, of the sort uh, that the authors uh, describe in the Indian context? Um, and we can't have this discussion uh, without talking about Air India, you know, which is in the process <laughs> of uh, privatized as we speak. Uh, yes, there are inefficiencies in Air India. Uh, it's, it's a loss-making entity, but it also serves a public purpose, right? You know, ME emissions like uh, you know one day Bharat now and uh, you know airlifts during the Gulf crisis. So, uh, so, so what's your what's your take on this? Well, I mean uh, the specific issue uh, whether there are problems with privatization. Of course, there are. Uh, I mean, by the way, uh, with with hospitals in particular, uh, there's a very strong tendency uh, for private hospitals to send cases that don't really look as if they're going to survive to the public hospitals because then it will show up on their record as not having cured enough patients. So they, these kind of biases do exist and we have to be watchful. But you know, in, in our case, I mean, for example, there's absolutely, in my way, I have not the slightest doubt that if Air India, if somebody is willing to take up Air India and you can't have a better uh, a corporate with a better uh, tradition than the Tatars, we should hand it over. I mean, it's a separate issue whether the bidding was totally fair. Uh, I think it must have been, but I would have no regret. I mean, the notion that you're going to stick with an airline for 20 years and allow it to run massive losses because it will help you if you had to evacuate 200 Indians uh, once in 20 years uh, from the neighborhood is just rubbish. I mean, you should just go and hire, hire a lot of carriers and bring them over. That's, that's no justification whatsoever. Now, I think, I think uh, the real problem with privatization is that when the, when the essential function is a government function, uh, then privatizing it requires you to have a sufficiently strong regulatory system that the social objectives behind that government function are also looked out. And for example, if you're putting someone in prison and you're also interested in rehabilitating them uh, so that they become better citizens when they finally come out. I'm not, by the way, sure that our government prisons do a good job, but the private guys would have no incentive in it whatsoever. So there are certain facilities, certain services, which I don't think lend themselves to privatization. You know, the example given on water is a, is a good one. I mean, I uh, in the book, um, I mean, it's quite clear that this is not an issue of competition because you're handing over a public monopoly to a private monopoly. Uh, you're, not, you're not setting up competitive ways of getting water supply. Um, but the solution there has to be that, you know, if you lay down the rules and you have a pretty clear uh, indication of how much can be charged for water and on what basis, then maybe the private guy would uh, economize uh, on costs more effectively than the public sector. I mean, the mention that uh, the, uh, it's interesting that the private sector is paying more uh, to, for wages than they are in Scotland. Well, in our case, by the way, it'd be quite the reverse. The government guys would be paid much more than the private because the government salaries are way above private sector salaries for the same, for the same job. But yes, I think privatization is an example where uh, mere mechanical appeals to competition uh, don't make sense. But bringing in superior management efficiency does make sense. And you have to remember that in our system, the public sector is actually totally captive to the bureaucracy. It's not really uh, an independent corporate sector. Uh, you know, the bureaucracy never lets go. And therefore, even if you have good managers in the public sector, you can't be sure that they'll produce the best managerial solution. But that's a very peculiarly Indian problem, I think. Fair enough. 
So, uh, all, you know, as, as you said, you know, we need to be very careful about selecting what areas we choose to privatize and uh, core governmental functions, you know, are, 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 you know we, should, we should be doubly careful. So, uh, now coming back to the authors, you know, uh, uh, you briefly talk about the way forward, you know, in, in, in the last part of your presentation, but how do we kind of uh, change the situation on the ground? Like, what, what is it that one, uh, we as uh, citizens and consumers can do to make sure that businesses compete in a more noble way, as you put it? And uh, what is the role of the government here? Uh, does does gov government really have anything to do in this? So, so what we talk about is there's three critical actors, segments, at least three that are at play. So first, the government has a role. And I think government has a role in two ways. First is where possible is because the you know the the, the fallacy that, that we expose is that somehow the government is extraneous to competition. Is the government actually competition cannot exist without a framework. And that framework can be provided either by the government, it could be provided by the industry, or it could be provided by powerful firms. So someone sets the guardrail, someone sets the rules, someone sets the norms. So the government should first ensure that the rules are such to reorient competition away from toxic. And often it doesn't have to be zero sum. Sometimes it has to, like if I want to buy a house and someone else wants that same house, that might be zero sum. But for other areas, it could be positive sum. And then what we have is this concept of noble competition, where the government says, what I want is the firms to compete so that they get the best out of each other rather than the worst. And you think about any two good athletes. The best thing for a good athlete is to have another good athlete that pushes them because then they, they actually, they're rewarded by it because one pushes the other and then you can have positive industry spillover effects and the like. The second thing that the government can do is say, even if we reorient competition to something noble, are there some things that competition simply will not provide? So when we spoke with the chief economist at one of the competition agencies, he said, you know, competition isn't always cracked up what it's meant to be. It can provide you the efficient outcome, but not necessarily the just outcome. So you'll always have in any sort of competition, and you know, I really appreciate um, um, uh, um, the, the comments here, is that, that you're not going to necessarily, there are going to be losers and you're not going to have, even in a Pareto optimal outcome, you're not going to have that redistribution. And that's where the government comes in to ensure that the people who compete, but just for whatever reason came up short, they're still compensated. Then the industry has an important role to play as well, particularly when they're in a race to the bottom that they realize that no firm can unilaterally de-escalate. And then the second important message that we have for businesses is beware of unleashing competition inside your firm, because rather than it, it could backfire significantly. We point out Enron to that effect. And then third, for we as a, an individual, we have to make a decision as well. I mean, at times we can opt out of this competition. So if you're caught up in a rat race, it is a good time to say, well, you're, you're maybe competing, but it's not gonna necessarily improve your well-being. It's not necessarily going to um, 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 lead to a better outcome for you or your family. But often the case is, is you can't opt out because if you opt out and you sit on the sidelines, everyone else will go on and then you'll be further behind, right? That's the concern. So <clears throat> one of the key things that we point out is dissent. And to have this conversation like you're having right now and to have then you know, to bring then the examples in India to the fore and then ask policymakers, you know, look, this is competition. It doesn't seem to be working. It's not, there are significant benefits, but if we continue along this line, it's not going to then necessarily increase necessarily well being. What can we do to reorient the competition to ensure that it's the noble type that benefits us? 
and brings out our best rather than our worst. You you mentioned the role of businesses, but and you know these days we hear a lot about uh, business responsibility and ESG investments. How businesses should be socially responsible, uh, but you know a lot of people say that uh, you know businesses will say a lot, uh, but when it comes to the actual uh, you know uh, you know when it, when when things start affecting their bottom line, then they only talk about profits and. Uh, and, and they'll not really be concerned about the environment or other social issues. Uh, so then, uh, you know, out of the people that you've identified, do we have a hierarchy of who needs to take the lead in making sure there is noble competition? Is, should it be the government? Should it be the people? Because it's very likely that businesses on their own are unlikely to do this. I'll, I'll give you an example from, from the UK, just so you'll understand. We're not suggesting that businesses uh, should do something beyond seeking profit we suggest that businesses can realize that they will profit from advancing this type of competition. Um, so in the UK, following the beef scandal, it became obvious that the existing regulation is useless. It became obvious that you can actually bypass it. And it became obvious uh, for the leading supermarkets that on one hand, they want to provide competitive prices. On the other hand, they are then hammered in the press for selling the wrong products, uh, misleading the, the, the consumers. So they created their own association and they now can tell you exactly which animal you have in your package. So did they do it because they care about consumers? Well, in an ideal world, I would say yes, but the reality they've done it because it's good business. Now, why would you do it? You would do it if you know that there is no other way. In other words, Regulation does play a role here. So all the elements that Maurice mentioned weave into each other. Because if you were living in a world that there's no accountability and the national regulatory uh, arm will never have found uh, you know, traces of, of horse in your, in your chicken, then possibly some businesses would say, so why would I care? No one will ever know about it. But if you have a government that understands that competition is not a magical remedy, you need to help markets to be competitive in a way that serves everyone, then they basically send a certain signal and create a cost for those who do not. And this is when businesses also have a role because they realize that they might actually be exposed, be it because of legal exposure or because of financial exposure, and therefore they engage in promoting that. The only ones that might do it for the sake of appreciating the impact of society are us. The I mean, of course, also businesses. There are many ethical businesses. All we're saying is that we do not expect necessarily that all businesses will be ethical. But what we argue is you can design a competitive structure where being ethical in the sense of competition is the right choice. This is the best way to deliver value. And Maurice mentioned Enron. Enron is a great example because what they have done drove the company to collapse. So they created intense competition between their employees with no guardrails. Every year, whoever was at the bottom was thrown out. You had to do whatever you can to stay in place. And what happens when you unleash that type of competition within your organization? People start to cheat. People start to sabotage each other. So the idea, I mean, the, the main message of the book is, and it's also relevant to the idea of privatization, is when someone sells you something because it's competitive, it might be that it's the great answer, the great remedy. But so often now in our society, we are misusing the ideal of competition to advance things that are completely unrelated. And by doing so, in a way, we disincentivize our, uh, you know, our our customers, our our employees. We are creating environments that are just toxic. So we are at the end of the hour, and uh, you know, I now request the audience to please ask ask their questions. They can, you know, you know, send their questions in the chat box, uh, and uh, I, I will now request uh, uh, Dr. Aluwalia for his uh, closing remarks, if he has any. Uh, you, you talked about uh, Indianizing some of the examples that the authors talked about and you mentioned 
uh, our farm sector but uh, just to make our job easier can you identify some uh, some 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 sectors in india for instance let's say the banking sector or the the, the, the financial markets in general say the our nbfcs because we've seen recent examples of melt meltdowns in uh, you know in in the financial uh, industry like ireland affairs and dhfl being two big cases where uh, they failed miserably uh, and you know also the role of uh, credit rating agencies there you know very, uh, something very similar to what happened in the us where uh, the ratings appeared to be fine and suddenly one fine day these companies started defaulting and there were problems all around and uh, 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 you know uh, similarly you know our uh, real estate uh, sector you know especially uh, these residential projects uh, uh you know which do not do not deliver on time and where consumers are kind of stuck for years and years um you know do you, do you, how how do you see do we uh, uh, because you know again these are examples of uh, situations uh where uh, our trust in the market uh, has kind you know directly or indirectly has led us to these problems so um, do you do you have anything to say on that yeah i mean well actually i think i uh you need to get uh, your your audience to read the book very carefully and to look at all the examples of market failure that it documents and ask themselves the question what's a good indian example and it'll be quite a rich collection and incidentally if you make such a list do remember to send it to me but you ask me to give you one example so i'll give you one you know it's my favorite example and i i defy anyone to justify why we do this it's not even generally realized that the reserve bank of india which regulates both the public sector banks and the private sector banks does not have the same power over public sector banks that it has over private sector banks i mean for example in the case of a private sector bank if the reserve bank finds that the management of the bank is heading in the wrong direction long before problems have arisen it has the power to actually remove the management on the grounds that it does not regard them as fit and proper it doesn't have that power with a public sector bank what is worse is the board of a public sector bank includes a representative from the reserve bank and also a representative from the finance ministry this means that when these banks and everybody goes around claiming that these banks are too much subject to political pressure etc cetera, etc cetera, and it's factually true that they have a much higher rate of non performing assets three to four times higher than the private sector banks the problem is it's not possible for the reserve bank to say uh, that listen this just isn't good enough uh, the cmd has to go which they have done with private sector banks now one of the reasons that doesn't happen is the cmd can easily say that look you've got a representative of the rbi on the board you've got a representative of the finance ministry on the board so obviously i didn't do anything that they didn't approve of i mean it's a classic case where the the reserve bank can at best write letters and warn and say you know things are getting a bit shaky etc but they cannot actually take the regulatory action needed now it's my view if you gave them that power first it would hugely increase the degree of vigilance that they would bring to the table and secondly the management for the first time would start looking at the rbi as a really serious powerful regulator the argument usually given that you can't uh, you ca you can't remove a head of a public sector bank is that he's appointed by the cabinet but you know uh, if a driver who who uh, a government driver who is also appointed by the government uh, does something wrong his license can be taken away it's the privilege of the government to keep paying the guy's salary if they want to so i would not care if the government felt that the rbi is doing the wrong thing they keep paying the fellow's salary but remove him as uh, head of the bank that will be the real punishment so that's a simple case you know put it to your friends uh, and on the the legal uh, our, our younger legal eagles and let me know if they think i've got a point no oh, absolutely so that i think that one uh, change can create a level playing field and maybe force the public sector banks absolutely absolutely uh, to be uh, you know more efficient 
Uh, now, so we've started getting questions now. So uh, one gentleman is asking, or uh, one gentleman or, or lady, I'm not entirely sure, is asking if, uh, uh, you know, you, you are not talking about, uh, I'm asking this to the authors, you're not talking about choosing between uh, competition and uh, monopoly, like in the pre, uh, you, you are essentially saying that uh, competition is good, but, uh, uh, you know, we need to manage it more effectively in the interest of the market. So if you could explain that a little further for, for our audience, saying that, that you're not arguing for no competition. Yeah, I, I, I could start off and, um, and, and Ariel will have a different perspective from, from, from Europe, but in, in, in the US, what you're seeing and President Biden um, issued a, um, an executive order is that we're, we're seeing really competition, the healthy types of competition, the, the good types of competition being squeezed out by one side, monopolistic competition, and then on the other side, um, the toxic competition. And what we wanna do is toxic competition is something that the state has a responsibility for. And then for monopolies, I mean, there are these, these rare exceptions where you have natural monopolies, but the government also has. So when you look at the bandwidth, right now you could see on both end, ends, the toxic competition and the monopolistic competition squeezing now the healthy competition. And in the US, we're trying now to extend more the healthy competition. Yeah, if I can just add very briefly, I think the way to look at it is that in most cases, competition will deliver. So what we're talking here about is not pretending as if there is an absolute truth that competition will always deliver. And that means that you have at least two levers that you need to control. One is the extent to which the state has to intervene to make sure that competition delivers. And again, the, um, the issue here, of course, is to stress this is not about turning everything into state-controlled markets. Far from it. It is about understanding that if you leave markets to themselves, they will not form in a way that will necessarily deliver. So this is one area where you operate. And the other area, per your question, is, of course, between monopoly and competition. No doubt competition is better than monopoly unless you have a natural monopoly. But if we speak about most, most markets, Competition will be better, but again, the same idea um, applies. What you need to just appreciate is that when someone tells you that competition will deliver, um, they might be right, but often what they'll do is they will advance their own specific interest and they will disguise it uh, behind the idea of, of competition. And this is just something we, we need to be aware of and mostly our policymakers need to be aware of, because otherwise it's very easy actually to, um, to lead them in the wrong direction. Okay, okay. so uh, Afif Khan has a question on uh, competition in the media and Dr. Alwale, it'd be great if you could answer this. Now, uh, our media is largely unregulated and uh, obviously it, it works well, uh, you know, in a democracy, they need to speak out. Uh, but in a certain sense, you also have this race to the bottom going on in the media where, you know, everybody's kind of chasing TRPs and the kind of news that we get these days, uh, we really don't know what to trust and what not to trust. Uh, so, do you, so uh, this is again, one example where, you know, letting competitive market forces kind of operate on their own seem to have ha had a negative effect. Uh, so what's your take on that? You're asking me? Yes, I'm asking you in India. Oh, uh, no, I, 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 it's, it's totally clear that the media uh, is actually driven by advertising. Uh, and uh, a very large part of the advertising is put out by the government. So it becomes incumbent on the government to distribute its advertising benefits across the board to newspapers that are, take one view or the other. And of course, governments at different times have been better or worse at it. Uh, and the rest depends on um, advertisers. Uh, and they're also amenable to, you know, government influence. But frankly, the newspapers are no longer selling a product which people are buying and paying a price uh, which they think reflects the value of the product. 
the product is actually being thrown at them. It's a little bit like Google and, and all these digital things that um, honest truth is that if you're not, I mean, if you're, it said that if you're not paying, then you're the product. And there's some truth in that with the newspapers also. However, I don't believe regulation is gonna solve this problem, quite honestly. And here, frankly, uh, it's the proliferation of uh, digital media, which depends less on advertising because it, it's not that expensive, uh, which will provide uh, a multiplicity of views. Understood. Uh, my colleague uh, Vedika has a question, professors. Uh, uh, she's asking if, uh, you know, uh, the problem that we describe uh, in, in the game, essentially the, uh, the game makers chapter, uh, where, you know, the, regular, you know the, the, the kind of egregious things that, you know, that some of these big tech, big tech companies do, uh, to what extent can regulation solve that problem? Uh, because given the fact that these guys are so <coughs> Uh, and, uh, you know, the kind of, uh, you know, uh, money power that they have. Uh, is it possible for us to ever solve this by regulation? Do we have a direct response to game, game makers? I can, um, I, I, I can start on this one. Um, so we... <laughs> In, in our latest book, we talk about a policy switchboard and for innovation, um, how the, the, the key thing with the, with the digital economy is that there isn't one silver bullet, right? There isn't one law. There's not like competition law that's going to um, deal with it. So you first have to look at all the different policies that are at play and then to then figure out how do you then recalibrate it? So first, you, if you're going to rely on competition, you have to ensure that the competition is healthy. And right now, the competition isn't healthy because we're the product and the incentives are not aligned. So you need to then get the privacy aspect taken care of in order to ensure that the incentives are aligned so that the competition lever would then work. But once you then even align your competition and your privacy incentives, you still may not necessarily get the innovations that are necessary in order to sustain mankind, right? That we take this sort of assumption that innovation will always come, will always take us out of the Malthusian trap of increase in population. And there you need to then ensure that you're getting the type of innovation that will then help address the current pressing problems of the day. And that's going to require other aspects of the policy switchboard. So no several, no several bullet is, is basically the short answer. Understood. I think uh, we are uh, out of time now. We are at the end of our, uh, you know, allo all allocated time. So uh, uh, it's very clear from this discussion that uh, you know, market and competition can be very good for us. What is content to understand? Um, uh, unbridled competition and a blind faith in the markets can cause serious problems. And uh, this book makes a very strong case uh, to be guarded against that and, uh, and take you know, initiatives at several, several levels, uh, at both at the, uh, primarily at the level of the government, uh, at the level of the businesses, and also uh, at the level of consumers and citizens. So uh, thank you so much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. Uh, many thanks to all three speakers for your time. It was lovely to have you over. Uh, we at Vidhi uh, will continue to hold discussions of this sort in future as well as part of our Vidhi book. Uh, Hi, one second. Please uh, do follow our work uh, on our website and on our social media handles. Uh, good luck with not getting tracked by BitTech. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, thank you.